This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to the podcast. Chris Graham and Rod Mullins talking NASCAR on the heels of a very exciting and apparently very well-watched Daytona 500 on Sunday. Uh, The uh, start and restarts and everything else pushed it into prime time for a good bit on Sunday night, Rod. And so good ratings for for the Daytona 500 and also big win. For Denny Hamlin emerging from uh, that that crowded pack at the top uh, of of the race card, and uh, boy, a lot of excitement. All the, the, the we had the big one, 21 cars involved in one crash. Uh, we had a little bit of everything on Sunday in Daytona. Yeah, we did, and I mean, you mentioned the winner of the, of the race, Denny Hamlin, and it was a very emotional big race for Denny Hamlin because you know J.D. Gibbs, who's the son of Joe Gibbs, former Washington Redskins coach. Uh, J.D. Gibbs gave Diddy Hamlin his big break. He's the one that believed in Diddy Hamlin. And so on that car, you know, you couldn't ask for almost a, a better movie script, almost the way it was written, that uh, J.D. Gibbs' name was on that car. And then, of course, number 11 was J.D. Gibbs' favorite number as well. I mean, he put Diddy Hamlin in that car, and when he did, you know, Diddy Hamlin has paid dividends. He's also caused some controversy over the years, too, that people go back and think about Mark Dillon. The, uh, the bump and the, uh, the wreck of Chase Elliott. But he had to be cheering for Denny Hamlin this time around for this race because it was something that I believe was almost a way predestined that this is going to happen because Denny Hamlin wanted to race well for J.D. Gibbs and also for his memory. I think it just it really paid off for Denny Hamlin on, on Sunday. But for, you know, but for the rest of them, I mean, wow, it was, it was one of those races where you thought uh, William Byron was going to come away with it. He, running strong there at one point. You know, there was still the controversy this past week of uh, Jimmy Johnson running over people, tapping people, hitting them, and, and so forth, just to get back toward the front. Jimmy Johnson did end up uh, where he wanted to be as a uh, return trip to the winner circle at Daytona. But William Byron was denied his chance at uh, getting into the winner circle. But for Joe Gibbs Racing, this was a big boost. Uh, they finished one, two, and three with Kyle Busch in second. And then, uh, of course, the, the third car there, Jones, coming in there at third. So it was a big win for uh, Joe Gibbs Racing, big win for Denny Hamlin. But I'm telling you, you know, you could have asked for a more exciting race, I think, this time around because uh, the, uh, the restrictor plate, or so to speak, if you want to call it the restrictor plate racing, it was changed. Last year, it was single single file driving uh, down the uh, two and a half miles there of Daytona. Now it was bunched up. Cars were bunched up, and they were struggling and fighting. I think I made that kind of comment last week. I think we were going to see bunched up racing and whoever was able to get the cleaner air and get out in front would probably ultimately win this race. That's what really really happened with Denny Hamlin after surviving all the carnage that happened. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Uh, you know, with, with the rules changes from the, over the winter, the uh, uh, we, we saw a lot, gosh, the quality of racing on Sunday – it was reminiscent to me of, of the you know the playoff stretch last year. We had a lot of good hard racing at the end of some of those races, and uh, you know it, it was good to see the the drivers out there really pushing themselves. You, you talked about the you know we didn't have the single foul race and we had you know, three wide. We had guys trying to s- sort of split the gap between you know the bottom and top part of the track. Uh, you know everybody was going for broke, and uh, that was that was uh, very exciting to see on Sunday. Well, to me, and that's the way racing ought to be. It, it, one of, it should be one of these things where you don't lay back and you don't try to, you know, pad everything and then go for the gusto on the third stage and, and make it for everything it's worth. I think everybody was racing, uh, racing for growth, like you said, and they were going for that win. They wanted to dominate. They wanted to be able to hold in there and dominate through the first two or three stages and win the whole thing. Uh, that's what they were looking for, but. You know, as with every Daytona race, as with the start of every season, there's always some controversy that comes out of it. And I think probably one of the big things that came out of it is Joey Logano's comment following the race of saying, uh, especially Michael McDowell, who drives it forward, he said, Michael McDowell did not try to help me whatsoever in this race. And it was right there toward the end of the race that, it's one of those things, and we've talked about it before, where it's every man for himself. They're trying to get there to the finish line and win that race. But uh, Joey Logano was looking for Michael McDowell to come up behind him and give him that little bit of an extra push 
And if I'm in that position, I'm not, I don't care what Joey Logano is trying to do. I care about what I'm doing in my car and what it's going to take for me to be able to get to the front and to be able to win that race. And so you had controversy there. Another thing that's been talked about, too, since all this stuff happened, has been the kind of unofficial discussion between Toyota and Chevrolet. They hooked up quite a bit on uh, Sunday afternoon of the race, uh, working together with one another in order for one of those cars to get to the front. And, of course, we know Denny Hamlin driving Toyota. He made it to the front. But Chevrolet fared pretty well as, uh, also during the race, except, of course, for the big wreck out. So what, what impact do you think the fact that this race, it, it was the highest rated sports TV program of the weekend. And this is a weekend when you had, well, you had the All-Star game, on, the NBA All-Star game on Sunday night. You had the NBA skills competition on Saturday night, including the dunk contest. You had some really good college basketball, Tennessee, Kentucky among that. And this was uh, actually by a good bit the, uh, the highest rated uh, uh, sports TV of the weekend. Uh, that's we, we talked all winter, Rod, about, you know, the the – NASCAR being feeling maybe it's at a crossroads. You know, the uh, attendance numbers were down. We saw some good numbers there, too. Daytona sold out the grandstands this weekend. Uh, you know, we talked about the TV ratings having been down for a while. Uh, so this could be some positive momentum for NASCAR here in 2019. I think it is positive. Uh, you know, it's a positive outcome. It's a positive uh, win, at least for NASCAR in that regard. But I believe that what they did was, especially toward the end of the season and the playoff picture, all of the ratings may not have uh, demonstrated that. But I think that it whet some people's appetites as to see what is NASCAR going to pull out for us here in 2019. And the big question was there was going to be a lot of unknowns. And I think there were a lot of people looking to see what was going to happen with the new rules package, how things were going to go this time around. They were interested in seeing, uh, of course, Daytona, and also it's the big Great American race, as it's always been called. But I think they were wanting to find out how this restrictor plate, or at least the reduction on the restrictor plate, was going to go and bunch up the cars, and, and it was going to see where everybody is going to stand. And, you know, who benefited out of this? I think more than anything, it wasn't the multi-car teams of the, uh, the drivers that benefited out of it. I think it all things that really benefited from this race because you got some exposure for some drivers. Matt uh, DiBenedetto, he got some exposure out of this. You had Michael McDowell also, who's been racing on the circuit for at least 10 years. They had a good performance on Sunday afternoon. Uh, you know, you kind of let you cheer in for the little guy, so to speak, out of this whole thing. Uh, Joe Gibson, of course, winning the race, that was another positive out of it. Uh, and the fact that uh, the story tied in with J.D. Gibbs. So there were a lot of positives being tied into this race, and I think it's just a, a great uh, prediction uh, to me, I think, of what's, uh, what's to come this season, unless something, uh, the bottom falls out uh, on it. You know, I don't know. I think it's going to be a good season this year. So you, we're, we're talking about some of the winners uh, and losers. Uh, I was looking at an NBC Sports column. I like this comment from Kyle Busch. Uh, you know, talk about in those last 25 laps, which I, I, a lot of us, all of us thought was exciting with uh, the hard racing. Yeah, there were crashes, a 21 car crash, seven car crash, nine car crash. Kyle Busch's comment on what caused the damage, brains came unglued. Was it that, you know, were there bad decisions made there or was that just hard racing combination of both maybe? I think it's a combination of both. And, and, and Kyle's just unhappy because he's not at the front back. And, you know, there's that, there's that little bit of, I guess, added flavor to this whole thing of you have now in the four cars in the Joe Gibbs Racing uh, Garage, you have Kyle Busch, Denny Hamlin, Eric Jones, and now Mark Truex Jr. Uh, for Kyle Busch, he wanted to break performance out of this. And he tends to think some people go brain dead in situations like this. And that might be true. But, you know, these guys have been practicing. They've been testing. They had a chance to practice at least a good week or so or have an idea about what the cars are going to be doing. We got a good sample of that in that advanced auto park clash and then uh, the duels that they had on Thursday night. These guys know what these cars can do. And sometimes, yeah, the brain might go dead, but it's also a combination of close quarters too while they're racing. Now, I talked about the TV ratings being good. You hear some people, though, raising concern that the race – was too long. It was three hours, 45 minutes without the red flag time. Uh, 
I think that actually factored into the ratings. You know, you had, uh, I want to say it was 11 laps to go, and we had the, the race basically stop there for a while to clear debris from the big wreck. And, uh, you know, you had all the commentary. Uh, you know, I think as the sun went down on the East Coast, maybe people were gravitating towards, uh, you know, kind of slowing down on a Sunday night and turning the TV on and seeing what was on, and they see this, you know, this spectacle of the Daytona 500. Um, I think there could have been some positives there, but you're, you're definitely hearing from people who say, boy, when you add in all that time, it, it was almost 8 o'clock when the, the, the TV show finally went off. You went straight into The Simpsons at 8 o'clock on Fox. And so maybe that's too long. What are your thoughts on that, Rod? How do you think this will play out? Well, to me, some people may say it's too long, but I think this is another one of those arguments that lends some uh, credence to the thing that we discussed last season. Why doesn't NASCAR start thinking about putting some of these races more in prime time or at least leading up into prime time? Uh, because I think it definitely attracted an audience and maybe there were some people that weren't wanting to you know, just wind down and maybe watch something on television that night. They had their choices, of course. With the uh, onset of Amazon and Roku and all these other things, they could have chose, you know, thousands of other things that were out there that they could have possibly watched on television that night. But people chose to watch the Daytona 500. And I think it was an excellent lead-in for them going into prime time that night. So I don't know. NASCAR may play around with this idea of maybe uh, let's see what happens if we uh, move the starting time back another hour or something, or move it ahead a little bit more to see how things are going to go. It might have ended up being that way. You mentioned it. You hit the nail on the head when you said that. The red flag situation that stopped the race, that took up a lot of time, too. But, you know, to me, this is this is nothing surprising out of one of these fast car races. I know it's a 200-lap shootout, especially at Daytona. It should be done in maybe about three hours. But things happen along the way, and that's probably what lend, uh, lended a little bit more interest in it finding out you had a 21-car pileup or 20-some-plus-car pileup uh, there. The big one happened, and people tune in sometimes for that big one just to see what was going on. You know, with, with so many laps left to go in the race, it made a big difference, I think. So time-wise, I don't think it was as much a big factor, you know, factoring in the red flag situation, but still, it was all out a great performance, at least for the Daytona 500 coming out of the gate, at least the race. Yeah, I thought it was a good show. I I think we worry too much sometimes. Well, not we, because uh, we don't. But I mean, the, 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 the critics worry too much sometimes about the length of 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 TV, whatever. You know, baseball games are too long, whatever. If you're enjoying it, it's not too long. Um, if you're not enjoying it, thirty minutes will be too much. So yeah, I think I think people just have something to want to have something to complain about, and uh, that's something for people to complain about, unfortunately. Um, I mean, it comes down to this thing, too, of uh, do you want to watch the entire race or do you want a hiding moment is what happened back in the 60s with an NFL uh, football game and did it change the entire complexity of, of the game? That's what people are really asking about it. I wouldn't want the race to be cut off just to go straight to whatever the 7 o'clock programming was on Fox. I would have rather watched the end of this race to see what was really going to happen. Yeah, I think, I've been saying for years, I think NASCAR, like, like you were just talking about, Rod, more, more prime time, the better. Uh, put it, put it in time when people are, especially, you know, this time of year, it's cold for a lot of people. So, you know, yeah, you're probably going to be in the house more, uh, in, in, as the winter winds down. But when spring and summer come along, you know, it's hard to sit down on a sun, a Saturday or Sunday. Most of the, most of the time on a Sunday, it's hard to sit down inside when you want to be outside doing stuff. You know, but when, when the day winds down, especially on a Sunday when you're winding down to get ready for work on Monday. You know, boy, turn on the NASCAR and have a good time. I mean, I, I think it I think it makes a lot of sense, but you know, they just haven't pulled the trigger on that for the most part. Yeah, NBC NBC could uh, take a, a page out of their success on Sunday Night Football yeah. and maybe translate this out in their next contract negotiating here with NASCAR. See what they could do, transform it into some kind of Sunday night or Saturday night feature for that matter, where it kind yeah. of improves and changes things. For Saturday night, because you don't want it to force part at the same time when the NFL is going. Well, there's that, and also, yeah, if you stay if you stay up later on a Saturday night, and you know there are plenty of fans, uh, I'm among them who 
who like to sit in front of the TV with a, a, a brew or a cider or whatever, uh, it's a little better to do that on a Sunday night or Saturday night, excuse me, when you don't have to work the next day. Uh, so, you know, but it, it all goes hand in hand. You enjoy, the, you know, have, have a night where you can enjoy it. Uh, you know, yeah. It, 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 and then the, the football thing in the fall, I think there'd be a lot of sense there. Uh, and uh, as, as NASCAR is renegotiating TV contract, I think it's a great point. That, that's something to maybe think about as we get closer to that TV renegotiation. Well, let's finish up here talking. Let you get us ready now. So we we Daytona Speed Week. The rest are out of our out of our uh, system now. Uh, we've let it go anyway. Atlanta is coming up, and uh, so get us ready, Rod, for Atlanta, and what we can look forward to the second race of 2019. Well, I think I mentioned last week that Daytona was going to be a mystery. We weren't really going to know what was going to happen until you know the green flag actually dropped for the race and everything. And then the checker flag was actually displayed, and we knew who was going to win the race. I think we're going to see the same thing in Atlanta. We're not going to know really what's going on because it's a rules package. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more of an intense rules package change now for the one and a half mile track, like Atlanta, Charlotte, and some of the others. But for Atlanta, Atlanta has been really rough on tires for some of these cars uh, for a number of years. It's going to still be a uh, it's not going to be a warm, it's not going to be a very hot day or anything down in Atlanta. And the weather, of course, is always busy when they go to Atlanta at that time. They've had snow before, they've had very cold temperatures. But the track is really rough on tires, and so that's going to be one test that's going to be put in front of these drivers. How well are these tires going to last through the race in order to get them to victory lane? The second thing is going to be the question, will this package affect them? And I think, yes, this new package is going to bunch up the racing even more when they get to Atlanta. Now, I know we're talking about a mile and a half, uh, you know, uh, short, well, I call it a short track almost uh, considering it's super speedway, but you're talking about this one and a half mile uh, you know, oval that's out there, or tri-oval if you want to call it that, when it comes down through there. Um, these tracks, especially a Charlotte and then your Atlanta, they are always rough on tires, they are always rough on the but Whoever perseveres and makes it through to the very end and is able to stay on top of that uh, that chassis change and the adjustment as they go on through the race, uh, that's where the difference is going to be made. Kevin Harvick has pretty much dominated this track in the past. I mean, he won the first race coming out of Atlanta, even though he was in Chevrolet and driving for Richard Childress. He won the first race for... Richard Childress Racing in the Goodrich car back years ago, 18 years ago after Dale Earnhardt uh, died, unfortunately, at, at Daytona. He won last year. I mean, he came out of the gate. He was broken when he got to Atlanta, and he did really well. So Kevin Harvey, he's got to give a little bit of a nod there. But, uh, you know, I think it's racing going to be on top of things, too. And we might see Kyle Busch actually come out on this one. I don't know. And then Mark Truitt, well, it's a good luck. He didn't finish the race on Sunday at Daytona. He's going to be looking to try to get that uh, car, that Bass Pro Shops car, back up in the front and at least uh, making a run towards the front where they could win. So you got the Gibbs cars that's going to be a factor in that. Hendrick has always had some good cars in Atlanta. It remains to be seen if they can keep that momentum going. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. I know that uh, it, it's going to be a lot of question marks. But uh, I think the question mark will finally be turned to an exclamation point, I think, from the time that checker flag falls in Atlanta on Sunday. Well, we have a lot to look forward to. Second race of the season coming up on Sunday. And, of course, Rod and I will get back together next week. We'll make sense of it and get you ready for the rest of the 2019 season. Well, Rod, thanks for your time today. Appreciate it, Chris. Thank you.